Good afternoon. My name is Hugh Forrest. I am the Chief Programming Officer at South by Southwest. Welcome to Tuesday, March 15th. A few items of housekeeping. We have the trade show, otherwise known as the Creative Industry Expos, happening downstairs first floor. Goes on for one more day. Check it out. Some pretty cool stuff there. As you've heard me say before, I think, I hope, we have some special merchandise downstairs uh, benefiting Ukraine. I know we're kind of low on these things now, but great goes to a great cause. We are ordering more, so pick one up before you leave town, please. Uh, we have a kind of cool session about the metaverse coming up at 2.30 in this very room, so stick around if you're interested in that. If you're more interested in Real world, the physical, uh, Jason Ballard of Icon is doing a presentation at Salon H at the Hilton, right across the street. Icon is one of Austin's top startups at this point. They were, uh, they were in fact one of the breakout stars of South by Southwest 2018 when they revealed the first ever 3D printed house. They're doing a lot of other very, very cool stuff. That again is at 2.30 across the way at the Hilton Salon H. Also, one more item of housekeeping. We have a podcast stage at the Austin Marriott. That's at the Moon Tower Room. Um, that goes on through Thursday, March 17th. We have now made that free and open to the public. So if you have friends that don't have badges that want to check out some good podcasts, some very cool podcasts, including a podcast with Mario Andretti uh, this afternoon at 2.30, that is at the Austin Marriott at the Moon Tower Room. Okay, to the here and now, to this session, to this keynote that we're very, very excited about. What we do at South by Southwest is creativity and innovation. What we do at South by Southwest is content in all its many, many forms. Whether that is music, whether that is film, whether that is gaming, whether that is social media, whether that is the metaverse, whether that is some kind of other immersive technology, whether that is flying drones who spell out a QR code as there were earlier this week in Austin. We do content. So today's keynote is particularly important because it focuses on the best, the newest, the most innovative ideas for content for the future. Please join me in giving a big South by Southwest welcome to Kevin Meyer of Candle Media, Candle Media Michael Casson of Media Link, and Cynthia Littleton a variety. You did it, Michael. We'll explain <laughs> that in a little bit. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Appreciate it. We know this is kind of the halfway point of the festival, and people have hopefully been having a fantastic time. Um, and But we do appreciate you engaging. This is a really great opportunity with our two guests here. We have people that just reflect all of the cross currents of media right now. Kevin Mayer has had quite a tour in the last 12, uh, 12 16 months of media and all of its inflection points. Michael has made a career out of being at the intersection of media, advertising, marketing, commerce, and that is the, those are all of the things that are driving the business forward right now. So it's a great opportunity for us to talk about some, you know, to talk about some specifics and also some big picture things. So we'll talk, we'll get, I thought we would start by talking, Kevin Mayer is in the midst with your partner, Tom Staggs, mm -hmm. who like you is a fellow Disney alum, longtime Disney executive. You have joined forces into a company called Candle Media, and you have been the buzz of Hollywood because you've been in town with a big checkbook talking to people about buying content assets. You've been very deliberative, and, and you and Tom have talked a little bit about the big picture of what you're going after. Today, I'd like to start by talking about sort of, you've been at it now for probably going on about a year. Where does Candle Media stand in terms of your building a, a physical infrastructure around that business? Well, I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, we actually started in earnest 
this summer, late summer, when we bought Hello Sunshine. Mm -hmm. That was our first purchase. With you might have heard company. something about that. Yeah, and um, and we partnered with Blackstone, and that has that was an ongoing um, search that I was that Tom and I were on to yeah. see who's the right private equity partner. Blackstone to being fulfill a, this vision. one of the largest private equity players and one of the companies that wants very much to put some money in media right now. Well, Blackstone is. I, 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 it varies from time to time. I think they're the biggest private equity firm in the world at this point, or have the biggest fund. We're part of a $26 billion fund, which is great. They are, a Blackstone specifically was, bit, was a great choice because they are very, they are thematic investors. And one of, their, one of the themes they have a lot of conviction on is content, growth in content spend. So they're investing in private equity with Tom and myself in Candle Media. They're investing in the real estate side. They're buying studios. Um, they have private um, ec uh, public equity um, operations and they're buying, you know, they're making their choices among public stocks uh, in that space too. So they're high conviction and they've been a great partner. And we got, we got put into orbit really with the, uh, with the Hello Sunshine buy. And then not, not long thereafter, we purchased a company called Moonbug. Mm -hmm. And if you have anyone out there has small kids, <laughs> you'll either like me or hate me for, having, for Moonbug. They have Coco <laughs> Melon is, is their primary um, asset. Uh, and, and intellectual property, and they have Blippi, and they have a whole, a whole bunch of um, kids' IP that was born on YouTube, and then taken from YouTube and multi-platformed into Netflix, into Amazon, you know, the streaming services, and also licensing and merchandising. And so we're in pretty good shape. Uh, we do have a vision for a modern um, sort of creator economy um, business, mm -hmm. which has traditional film and television assets you can, that are sold to, to streamers. Um, we have social media storytelling as best evidenced by um, Moonbug, which again starts on YouTube and then those stories propagate to other platforms, and then commerce. I think there's a, in that, my time at TikTok, I really saw the ability for content and influencers to create audience dynamics that are very, very um, conducive to making, to concluding commerce transactions. It's happened in China to a large degree, this social, social media um, commerce. And we think we have the assets to bring to bear uh, to do the same thing uh, here in the U.S. and, and parts west. So and, and commerce can generate the kind of numbers that people in the content business are accustomed to with, you know, big successful movies and big successful TV shows. You see that that market is that big? Yeah, it's very big. I mean, here's one example. Hello Sunshine has a, has a show called The Home Edit. The Home Edit, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, is based on a company called the home edit. That I saw that they just that bought we just, That we just bought, yeah. that's where I'm going, that, um, that goes to people's homes. It started off with celebrities, but it goes to you know, anyone who hires them. They go in and they reorganize and edit your home. And they come in with products to, you know, so you can rearrange your garage and your closets and everything else, and they do a great job. And they make the shows out of it, an unscripted show. We bought the underlying company, and that is a big commerce play. So that's the, the, and there's a big social media component around the home edit too. The founders of the home edit are very active on social media. There's a huge amount of resonance there. So that's a great example of taking content and moving it into commerce and then social media storytelling. So. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Mike, let me ask you, Michael, you have known Kevin a long time. You know he's embarking on this big adventure with, again, a nice bankroll. What, what did you, what, what was your advice as he, as he started out on this journey in terms of what to look for and where the, where the opportunities well, might what, be? What, what, what I think Kevin said at the beginning, um, identifying Blackstone as his partner because they had a focus and Kevin had a focus. We've been in conversation about this strategy f well before they implemented the first deal uh, in the summer and it was about that. and he was clear and Tom equally clear on that focus. And I think, you know, hard to give Kevin advice on many things that he doesn't give me advice on, but uh, I, I will tell the audience why uh, we played that song, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, as we were sitting in the uh, green room, uh, I looked at Kevin and I said, you know, you've got the brains, I've got the looks, let's go make lots of money. And I asked them to <laughs> uh, thank you for agreeing with me on, you know, I agree with them. That's uh, great. There you go. And we did do a quick calculation on the copyright and the IP, <laughs> IP yeah. benefits and how much. Yeah. That's fair <laughs> use, as we discussed. It's, it's fine. <laughs> but, but, but truthfully, the advice I gave Kevin was advice he was actually giving himself, which was be focused on where they're going. What, what, what's interesting to me is uh, being on a stage with you um, in 2022, one of the earliest panel conversations I ever did was 22 years ago with Variety, with Peter Bart, uh, a, a name that is 
you know, well known by many in our industry. Great and, boss of mine, and, great and, and beloved boss, yeah. And this was in 2000, uh, and the topic sentence of the, of the panel was content meets commerce. So we're not in a conversation now that hasn't been around for a long time. What I think we found is that inflection point where content is influencing everything, but particularly commerce as we're looking at it. And there's a whole lot behind that, but just it's funny for me to be on a stage 22 years later, really talking about the, the C's, content, commerce, uh, et cetera. Um, I mean, it, we've moved a level beyond watch friends like Rachel's sweater <laughs> yes. and, and click. Now, now Rachel's sweater is the show. <laughs> I actually asked her if she ever had a blue sweater. <laughs> the answer was no, but everybody said, what, how are you gonna buy that blue sweater? <laughs> Let me ask you a little more specifically, Kevin. So is the idea that the candle mania is a, uh, will be a, a traditional kind of roll up where you will, candle media will provide some backend services, administration, you know, distribution, marketing, is that the idea or are you just building a holding company and you intend to house these imprints and have them run completely autonomously? It's actually neither. Um, we are building, we're trying to replicate the sort of framework that we had at Disney, where Disney is an integrated company. There's, you know, there's no question about that. We bought um, brands and franchises that plugged into that, that company and they were the creative, um, the creative folks and the creative teams were allowed to run very autonomously. We bought Marvel. You know, Kevin Feige, he runs the Marvel Studios, he decides what to make, he, he decides where the cinematic universe is going, he does all that stuff. You would never want to get in the way of that. But in terms of distributing the films, monetizing them, deciding you know, to put them into streaming service, the windowing of all that, um, which, um, which uh, characters are going to be um, exploited for licensing and merchandising opportunities. So all the monetization is done at the Walt Disney Company level, and we're, that's the approach that we're taking here. Candle Media is a fully integrated operating company. It's not a holding company, nor is it a company that just provides back-end services to its component parts. We're a fully operational working company, um, and we're building that through acquisition. And then once we do these acquisitions, there's gonna be a huge amount of organic build that's gonna come from that. So yeah, you, you, you know, we're not pretending to be Disney or anything like that. that we're not, we don't have that much hubris, but we like that organizational philosophy that worked so well at Disney. Keeping the creative engines going and autonomous, everything else is truly integrated. And will you, at, at the Candle Media level or at the Hello Sunshine level, will you be in the business of financing your own content or do you intend to still partner with the major studios and platforms? Yeah, that's a good question. The, one of the theses that we, the theses that we had, one of them, the, the content, commerce, and community one, that big one we just talked about, that's, that's the main, strategy buying the company, but if you look just at film and television, that component of it, there is a real value for, to independence at this point. And the, other, the only thing that the independent producers haven't had, they haven't had enough scale, and they haven't had access to capital. They've been capital starved, and they've been you know, um, just not big enough to leverage the right deals with streamers. Now, on the, on the other side, streamers have no option to go to the large studios anymore, by and large, because those large studios have their own streaming services that they're feeding. I helped our silo walls are getting silo. builder and build that's what we bigger and bigger. That's what Bob Iger and I did my, our, my last five years at Disney is that's we architected that, that every single, and it's the right strategy, I think, every single piece of creative output that comes from any part of Disney, whether it be, you know, something that's branded Disney, something Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, that all goes in Disney Plus. If it's come something out of the ABC stu television studios or 21st Century TV, those are basically targeted for Hulu. But everything we make ultimately comes to one of our streaming services permanently and exclusively. That means if you're Netflix, you can no longer license Disney mm -hmm. product. If you're Amazon, you can't license mm -hmm. Disney product. And I was running content sales in order to eliminate them right, and right. get rid of content sales. So independent, independent producers are the last bastion of content that these, that these streamers can go to outside of the stuff that they make themselves. So being independent is a very substantial benefit. It, we're independent in the face of double digit growth in demand for the kind of content that we make. And if you have capital and scale, that when we're piecing these companies together so we can go to market in a much more leveraged way, and we have capital, some projects will take all the way from development through a finished product and you'll license that and own it and create a library like studios do. Mm -hmm. Some will do you know, EP type stuff or we're just the producer and we get paid a credit, some will be in between. But if you have scale and you have capital, then you can start making those choices affirmatively rather than just being at the whim of the buyer. 
And do you think that if you have Reese Witherspoon or all of the all of the heft that you can bring to IP, you can walk into Netflix or Amazon or even Disney Plus and say, no, I don't want a cost plus deal, which means they give you the budget and they give you 20, 30% on the high end as the producer's fee, as opposed to the old game, which was a little more like the casino, and the studio came in, had money in the game, and in success, everybody made a lot of money. Now in success, for the most part, producers know that your upside is, cap side, is capped at 20, 30%, and that's a very predictable game, but it's a different game. But do you think that, yeah. I'm, Michael, I'm gonna let you uh, yeah, talk, I mean, but I wanna see what Kevin, okay, here's, as here, you're playing that. Here's the you're example. in the middle of building this right Let me now. give you an example of what we were- Because that to seems to be the, the, the real Well, there's gonna be crux. a tussle. I mean, the streamers wanna own all their product and pay you and buy you out and, pay, and just pay you a premium. We as a studio want to own the product and not and, and more and more of the product and not sell it out and so you continue to own the IP. One example of this, Moonbug, not a Hello Sunshine, but a Moonbug example. We own all the IP in Moonbug. And Moonbug was a 2.7 billion valuation, something that I think really, which was a high valuation, but I think also really opened people's eyes to the market for this kind of yeah. really like preschool Based content. on the value of the IP, it wasn't a high price. I'm a, I, I it was not a high price. I, it was, I mean, just- It wasn't, I, well, thank you for saying that. But it was a good price based on the value of the IP. People thought we overpaid for Marvel and all that stuff. I, we, when, Tom and I know the value of IP. We're pretty good, we're pretty experienced with that. So I think we did pay a very fair price, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess time will, time will prove that. You but here's, a, here's an example of when you have the goods that streamers need or anyone needs, you have some leverage. So. Coco Melon, that's the biggest IP that, um, that Moonbug has. It's the largest YouTube channel in the world. And they, when they bought it, it was a 60 million subscribers, and now it's almost 140 million subscribers. It's massive. And last year, it was the second most streamed television show on Netflix of all shows. The only bigger one was Criminal Minds. It was this much bigger. Coco Melon was almost the number one show. And that Coco Melon show was YouTube episodes strung together into, episode, into TV length episodes. Packaged in 10 episodes, sold to Netflix for a license fee, non-exclusively. We own it. Netflix does not own anything. They paid us a fee, and they are benefiting tr tremendously from it. It's a huge win for them. It's a huge win for us. And it's still on YouTube with that huge audience. And we're getting a lot of advertising uh, revenue from YouTube. So if you have the goods and you have a finished product, you can get the deal that you want. We've already done it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm sorry, Mikey, were you going to say? Yeah, well, what I was going to say is two things. It's not the old days of the studio knocking on your door, it, 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 the, the producers don't have to go to the streamers now. The streamers are coming to the producers because of Kevin's point. The studios are all gonna have exclusive rights to their product, so you do need the independence. So this is a time when the independents have leverage that they wouldn't have had traditionally, number one. Number two, you, you have to understand that, and I know we're gonna get into this, but this, commerce part of this, I look at the commerce part not only as the buying of the goods and services, but the advertising side of it, the monetization through advertising. Right. We're watching that change right now. I mean, as, as Kevin developed Disney Plus, it was clear at the beginning that there wasn't going to be an AVOD alternative at the beginning, <laughs> but it was clear if you looked at it that there was gonna be one ultimately. I mean, I'm throwing that question to him because where in the cycle was that decision made to ultimately do it? And, you know, the, the other guy uh, starts with an N. I think when that avenue revenue per user number started to go in the right direction and yeah, they I mean, saw that the ad product was even more, even yeah. more exactly. lucrative yeah. potential. You know, in your decision process at the beginning, you must have known that that was on the on the. Well, t t completely. I think Disney's doing the right thing with that. Um, it is. If you look at Hulu as an example, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Hulu has an ad-free and an ad-supported product, and that was part of our Disney family of direct-to-consumer services. So I know this pretty well. Um, the ad-free was eleven ninety-nine a month, and the ad-supported was seven ninety-nine a month. I think that was the that was the number. So it was a five-dollar difference, and um, so maybe six ninety-nine. But that $5 that you got for um, ad-free was actually worse than the ARPU you got for ad-supported because there's an $8 of ad-support mm -hmm. per, and maybe now it's nine. It's actually grown, you would know this too. So you're three to $4 better off if a subscriber takes ads than if they take no ads. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a massive demand for in-stream, you know, in over-the-top, high-quality advertising, 
that is just, because there's a flight, the linear television is, the exodus right. of advertising from linear television is, is extreme, and they're going, they still like <clears throat> high quality um, video mm -hmm. as context, so they go to over the top services like Pluto, like Hulu, Absolutely. and now like Disney Plus. Michael, are your clients freaking out that so much activity is going to subscriptions, so <clears> much <throat> activity is happening, so all the buzzy shows are happening in a, in a Absolutely, format. And, and you know, the, the, um, the challenge is traditionally and historically, we looked at that inextricable link between the creation of and delivery of content supported by marketing messages of some sort. That was the that was the value exchange that happened. You know, I always like to go back to where it started, and people say, "Well, it used to be free for television," and I say, "It never was free. The exchange you made was, I'm going to give you my time and my attention, and look at those commercials, and you're going to give me content." That break <clears throat> occurred, and if you're, you know, back to your question, Cynthia, are the clients, the brands, freaking out? Of course they are, because they're trying to figure out. How do we play? How do we get our message across? Is it going to be back to just you know the Coca-Cola can on the table? I don't think so. I mean, sure, there'll be more of that, but they are at that point where they need to figure out, they, the brands, need to figure it out. And now with Disney making this announcement, which I presumed was on the, you know, on the roadmap from the beginning, I heard, and Spencer used to work for Kevin back in the day at Disney, Spencer Newman, who's the CFO <clears throat> uh, Netflix the other day said, "Well, we're not religious." <laughs> there was a softening. Yeah, we're there not will religious. Be as on there was a softening <clears throat> at Netflix. The CFO of Netflix actually softened to the the their response for ten years has been absolutely the the thought of advertising on Netflix. Yeah, is, and, and, is and you imagine blasphemy. a five second pre roll in front of every Netflix video. How how many billions of dollars is there? It's 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 that they, they don't have a choice at some point. They're gonna have to do economic. In fact, a, a very smart uh, Variety yeah. senior media analyst. Gavin Bridge on this very stage said that Netflix, it'll be, it could be five years, it could be 10 years, but Netflix will have Two it. Two years. All right, I Kevin, Kevin well, Mayer I, predicts. I, I want to tell you, and I can't read into this more than I asked him to do it, and he's going to do it, but Ted Sarandos is going to uh, sit with me on the stage at the Cannes Lions this year. And, in the lion's den, no less. And, and into the lion's den. And someone said to me, how the hell did you get him, the guy who won't accept advertising, <laughs> to sit on a stage at a conference that celebrates advertising? I said, well, he's got two hats because Netflix is a pretty big advertiser in terms of what they spend on promoting their programming. So that is advertising. The incoming is the other. I'm not suggesting that him doing that is anything other than him doing something that I asked him to do, but truthfully, it gives you an indication that that softening and it not being religious will, will, will occur. That doesn't make it easy for the advertisers because they still have to figure it out. And that's part of what keeps us busy, you know, candidly, is helping advertisers identify those opportunities. And, you know, one of the reasons that we reimagined MediaLink at the end of last year at right. UTA, uh, at United Talent Agency, was uh, the realization that being closer to the creator economy for MediaLink was a smart play because our brands and our clients are saying, WTF, you know, how do we get there? And we have to start creating more of our own content, which by the way is a part of where Candle Media has opportunity, and Kevin and I have certainly mm -hmm. talked about this, um, well, I've talked and Kevin's listened. He hasn't agreed yet, but uh, but truthfully, um, we've been doing this routine for 20 years, so it's <laughs> got a buddy act going. Yeah, a little we, bit, a little bit. We've got a we got a gig going, but 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 truthfully, the opportunity to get brands more active in the financing of that content is another mechanism, and then it becomes a brought to you by. Mm -hmm. And just as just a um, Michael's company, MediaLink, was sold in December right. to United Talent Agency, one of the Hollywood's largest talent agencies, for 125 million dollars. And that is an, another deal that's a signpost of how all these things are converging in ways that they did not, you know, new new alignments are being formed. Kevin was talking about the the new sort of new world order at Disney of all of the content going to different streamers. 
And we've seen that at, not at, only at Disney, we've seen it in NBC, NBC Universal. We, it, it's been inside of three years, the, the, literal, the profit centers, all of the business models have literally just been re-engineered. Yeah. It is such a shift from literally decades of what I think we're looking in hindsight and recognizing, you know, incredible profit margins, incredible momentum. But do you, do you feel like that pay, the pay TV moment that built ESPN that <clears throat> is that business is that going to be a moment or are we going to see it morph because I think we've seen a lot of these digital MVPDs and that that business seems to have this, the digital MVPDs the Hulu's the YouTube lives they seem to have the same problems as the traditional well MVPDs because they're the long same long product time. they're just delivered a different way there's they're, they're called over the top they're just pay TV services I mean we when we decided to launch it at Hulu we wanted to we thought there was an opportunity to do, maybe do a little better, a little different on new devices, on connected TVs, so the interface would be uh, a more pleasant experience, which I think it has been. Um, you could dynamically insert ads, which would be great. But I will say it is linear television, but the 24-7 streaming channel is linear television, but how no, it was delivered on a satellite box, on a cable box, or on uh, over the top on the internet, it is the same product. So it is experiencing the same problems. We thought that it would hopefully offset some of the downward trajectory of subscribers. It really has not. I think that, um, pay, that the pay TV subscriber universe is in free fall, actually. Do you think like it, um, it doesn't settle? Well, here's what's going to happen. I'll, I'll, my prediction is this. Soon, the, um, the only people well served by, by pay TV bundle are sports fans because that's where you find sports. Putting that's on your hat be. as yeah. chairman of DAZN, a yeah. uh, streaming service well, that is yeah. Mostly focused in Europe and Asia, but a, but a player in the sports game. Yeah, a, a big, I think a pretty big player in the sports game. If you're in Europe, you would know it well. And we have boxing in the U.S. and around the world. But this is putting on my ESPN hat. You know, I launched ESPN Plus when I was at Disney, and, and so I know a, kind of the thinking behind that. And my fear is that the it will continue to decline and decline and decline until basically you have sports fans, because the only only thing that really has to be delivered on a time basis is sports and news. And that's the only thing, other than that, all entertainment programming can be delivered on a, you know, on-demand basis through streaming services. There's no fundamental reason to have a linear channel experience for, for entertainment. In fact, people don't prefer it. There's so, some spectacle live events, you know. Um, yeah, perhaps. well, there's, okay, well, you put those in there too. So you have the Oscars and you have some other live events. So the live programming is the only universe that has to be served live, almost by definition. Mm -hmm. So what happens? The, it's going to continue to decline until there's just basically mostly sports fans. And still, there are a lot of sports fans in the US and around the world, but that's the value proposition in the US of paid television. Do you think is that 30 million, 40 million? Yeah, something less? like that, 40, 40-ish, maybe 50 even. But then you have to look if you're ESPN, if you're the other providers of sports, are you better off wholesaling into this audience that is purely sports fans, or are you better off retailing to that audience? The same, same calculus we went through at Disney to launch Disney Plus. Are we better off wholesaling our content to Netflix and the other streamers, or being a streamer? So ESPN and other providers will have to go through that same calculus. Okay, pay TV is small enough now that, wow, why should we be a wholesaler, shouldn't we be a retailer, can make more money. And that's when you'll see ESPN and others pull themselves out of the bundle, go direct to consumers, and then there is no more bundle. Their pay TV is over. And that's, need, that's the trajectory that it's on. And you need quite a stomach to be able to do that because you had to make <laughs> right. that decision to cut that income stream off to make the bet. Right. So. Th those are, uh, you know, uh, those are rooms you want to kind of understand the dynamic of the decision to say, we're not going to take these billions of dollars over here because we're making the bet over here. And generally speaking, in corporate America, at least, those decisions are tough because the short term versus the long term decision is really tough to make. There's a certain tone of voice in this and they always in the earnings calls, they always make the CFO deliver the news uh, appropriately. But there's a certain tone of voice that the CFO gets when they're start when they're going to announce, OK, and in this quarter, we're going to take this level of a hit. I mean, the things have been, <laughs> been so upside down that for a while there last year, the companies were announcing how much they were going to lose and the stock. <laughs> The stock would yes, go up. It interesting, it, it? It's been. You, do you I th get a sense from you both in the market that there's a, been a leveling off? Certainly, we saw that in the Q4 earnings cycle. There was a leveling off of Wall Street's enthusiasm for well, well go go. I, I, what I was going to say about the calendar, you know, we certainly all understand 2020 was a tough year for 90% of the people in the world, companies and 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 civilians alike. 
2021 was a banner year for everybody that you can find economically. And I think the prognosis that 2022 is going to continue that momentum is absolutely correct. The question for most, and I look at it through the lens of marketing and advertising, but the, but the you know, that point of 23 is going to be, mm -hmm. okay, now we're in a real world. Mm -hmm. We've had this momentum, the buildup from 20. All the left, all the pent up savings. Right. All, all of that is on. just rising tide. You know, yeah. everybody's floating above the surface now. What happens in 23, I think, is going to really be the question from a macroeconomic perspective as to will that momentum continue, mm -hmm. save geopolitical you know, conversations, which hard to save right now because we're right in the midst of it. But but as we become, it is truly, as we become more globally, as the business becomes more globally connected, it's like they say, you know, a butterfly flaps its wings in one country and creates a, a tsunami in another. Well, and that's, that's only going to increase in a world of global... And, and, you know, if you look at it through the lens of talent, um, you know, I used to kid around and say if you had a show in on, on linear television that hit 100 episodes, you guys know this well, that was the magic number for syndication in the old days. And the joke used to be if you had 100 episodes geographically in Los Angeles, you could afford a house north of Sunset. <laughs> and, and that would be, you know, 100 episodes yeah. entitled you to a house in a good neighborhood. We know that doesn't exist anymore. Maybe 100 episodes will exist, but the ancillary rights and the ancillary economics. Mm -hmm. So it, it, this is turning a different model upside down, which is talent, mm -hmm. just from that perspective. And now being inside the halls at UTA, I see, you know, even the impact on talent that's happening, because to your point, there's a there's a ceiling now. And, and where, you know, where Kevin and you all are investing, I mean, I know you, there were some snickers about Hello Sunshine being valued at 900 million on the on the surface in within the industry that felt like, wow, what is there? Because they don't have a big library. They don't have they have incredible promise and they're clearly very industrious, incredibly impressed by CEO Sarah Harden. She is really an impressive person. Um, but clearly you are betting on what we talked about, the social commerce and the ability of Reese and the footprint of her and like-minded creators to bring audiences to them in that direct-to-consumer way. Is it really this, is it social that drives all of that? that social is a big, is a kind of at the center of everything, I think. Um, and yes, I think uh, we are counting on the fact that we can you know, drive uh, a lot of traffic and fandom around her social media presence. She has a book club. She gets a lot of a lot of the intellectual property that she make that Reese makes into you know filmed entertainment, whether it be series or movies, comes from that you know access to incredible thinking from these her book authors in her in her universe. So a lot, that there's some advantage to access to ideas from that perspective. And I just do think that um, we are going to build a library. We didn't buy a library, but we're building one um, because we're, gonna, we're going to achieve ownership in shows that we really care about achieving ownership in. So we're going to have a very, uh, a very, uh, a full spectrum model, if you will, from producer fees, which is great, you know, make a lot of money doing that, to full ownership and it's going to end library. And in between, you can have partial ownership, a lot of co co productions and stuff like that. We've already done some in Hello, Sun Hello Sunshine. So that's another model. You don't have to own the whole thing, but now we have the capital that allows us to make, take those bets and we're gonna make those bets. It adds risk to the equation, but it also adds upside. And as for high price, I think um, we talked about Moonbug being, I think, a pretty low price. People snicker. I mean, honestly, if you go back to our, the days when we bought Pixar and the days we bought Marvel, we were roundly criticized for overpaying dramatically. Marvel especially, I remember people thinking, what, have, have we were they just, lost we had the their last minds? That, that, that's worth <laughs> You name it, 60, 70 billion dollars today. Pretty good bet. And it was a good bet. Now, not every bet turns out great. I'm not saying that every bet I make is always great. But I will say, if you, we were very um, disciplined and careful, and we have a, a roadmap that gets us to a value well in advance of what, in, in, above what we paid. So we'll see. I mean, the proof is in the pudding, but I think we'll come out looking pretty good on that one. It is. I mean, if you step back and look at the business as it is now, I mean, it is kind of fascinating the talent of the scale of Reese and, and you know, some of that they have this lever, these levers that they can push that they never did. I imagine, Michael, now with your, you know, deeper connection with UTA, as we talked about, opportunity is the theme of this, this discussion. The opportunity for people to move, literally move people to, the, to markets that they 
want to establish is pretty incredible with social. Well, the commerce piece of this is the thing that gets really sexy because <laughs> talent today understands that their association with brands is more than just being a spokesperson for- More than holding the Coke can. Yeah, it's, it's not that. And, and, and not everybody can influence it, but we certainly have enough examples of people like Ryan Reynolds or people like Kim Kardashian or people, you know, down the line, Paris Hilton, who we were just at a conference with, and she stood up and she was introduced as one of the, you know, OG of, of, the, of that world. Yeah. And she really is, you know, and you look at that and you say the association of brands of celebrity and brands is no different than product placement on steroids, right? The idea of product placement was to borrow celebrity. If you're holding an Apple computer or working on an Apple computer in a movie, you want to be cool because you've got an Apple computer. So you're using the celebrity of the brand along with the celebrity of the, of the talent, if you will. We're seeing that commerce and celebrity come together in a very meaningful way, and it's working. I mean, we've got a couple of you know, newly uh, hatched billionaires and Rihanna and Kim Kardashian and, 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 you know, down the list of people who are cashing in, but not in a negative way. There's never anything negative about cashing in legitimately, <laughs> but we're, we're seeing that, that cash register ring loud and clear. So talent is really getting, moving up the, the food chain. And I would imagine that there's also like, you know, just as, in, just as talent, you don't want to be in, you know, you don't want to be in too many movies in one year. There's a certain, that you've got to have some boundaries. Like, you know, you don't want to put your name on everything. You want to make sure, like, I would imagine that there's a whole new discipline for talent management in how do you determine opportunities and how do you know what's, what's right with you? I, I would imagine that those conversations well, we, are going we actually on. do it scientifically. And, and one of the great things that I inherited uh, it, it, with MediaLink at UTA was something called UTAIQ. And UTAIQ really develops the basis for those kinds of decisions. So it's not just random when somebody sits down and negotiates Kevin Hart's next movie you can actually show up with data that indicates why Kevin Hart should earn X amount of dollars for this movie. And by the way, you can apply that same thing to brands in a traditional sense. And it comes back to what, at least at the intersection that MediaLink lives out, which I've said and you said a bit ago, marketing, media, advertising, entertainment, and technology, at that intersection, data is driving all the right decisioning. So data should be driving the same kind of decisioning that you make around content around the uh, endorsement opportunities, the product opportunities, you use the same data that uh, uh, brands have used forever. Well, I mean, talking, about, talking about vehicles right now, there is nothing, let's talk a little bit about your, um, uh, your uh, TikTok and mm -hmm. sort of where it stands right now. Um, I saw you quoted, I think last year, saying that, that TikTok, you had a brief association with them as CEO uh, yeah. in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I know it was a, it was a combination of geopolitical situation that was happening at that time with the Trump administration, but it was a short tenure for you, about, about three months. Yeah. Um, but in, in the big picture about, about TikTok, you, you've said that, they, that their algorithm, that their recommendation, their ability to put content in front of people that they actually do want to see the success of that algorithm. Have you now, now that you're on the entrepreneurial side, do you see a way to turn that into a growth driver? a profit generator for candle media related businesses? Well, I think, you know, TikTok is one of several social media platforms. And I think that's really social entertainment. If you look at TikTok specifically, that really is about capturing people's time and attention that otherwise would probably be spent watching a Netflix or something, because it's truly immersive video. And it's not a lot of communication that happens on TikTok. It is mostly, you know, pe people create and then you get your feed and you're passively watching a whole bunch of stuff that is super interesting to you because the AI technology that, um, that ByteDance has is second to none. It's incredible. Um, and, and so being in the social media space, generally speaking, with TikTok, with Instagram, with YouTube, I think that's where opportunities are, are, are going to lie. And I do think that you can um, attack it from a bunch of different angles. Again, you know, getting back to Moonbug, that was IP born on YouTube. Mom and pop creates, a, creates something that's fun. It explodes virally. We buy it, I mean, not a multi-platform and make a lot more, demonetize it a lot better than they ever could. So it's a win-win. They get, they get bought out, we own it, and then we can monetize it. And I think there's, it goes both ways, though. A lot of stuff that we make can actually end up um, storytelling on, uh, on social media. And I think we're, 
We're going to be um, pursuing some social media storytelling assets that hopefully will be announced soon that are going to be fun. Um, but I do can, think- Can you monetize that just purely through advertising on social? Yeah, well, I think when we're on social, we're going to monetize it a few ways. You can do third-party advertising, for sure. You can, you can be a, um, a marketer for Thank the right God brand. Thank God I have grandchildren here. <laughs> Thank God there's some opportunity. So you can do that. You can create your own brands. If you're, if you're a, a celebrity with enough resonance with, uh, with your followers, and you can authentically, the thing about social media, the connection has to be utterly authentic. If you, try, if you sell yourself and you, and you um, create messages that clearly don't fit what your followers expect you, to, you know, to, to, to present to them, you have a real problem. You can't just force marketing. On, you can't fake you your you life, can't fake you can't it. stage it. You gotta actually use it. Paris Hilton uses certain products, she can authentically talk about it and boom, then, then it works. The other thing, again, if you're big enough, you can create your own brands. And that's what Rihanna has done, and that's what the Kardashians have done. Um, Paris Hilton has done that. That's at the top, of the very top of the food chain. But it is a way for celebrities, since they're capped a little bit in what they can make now on film and television, it's a way for them to very much capitalize on, their, uh, on the degree of which people hang on their every word on social media. Some of these people have 100 plus million you know, followers. It's Variety. real. It's Variety real. reported <clears throat> last week that the Kardashian family collectively has more social media followers than Netflix has global subscribers. That <laughs> Netflix, doesn't surprise me. Yes, and Netflix is up to about 220 yeah, in the last million, yeah. the last yeah, time we talked. It, it, it's quite extraordinary. And, and at the core of it, Kevin just said it, but I'll put a word on it, is authenticity because if you're not authentic in this environment, you're dead. If you're it's done. not actually your there's, kitchen, you're in there's, trouble. There's two things that exactly. drive marketing today in, a, in an interesting way. One is purpose, and, and it's not just uh, tick the box purpose. Y you have to demonstrate it. And authenticity, because if the brand doesn't, whether that's a celebrity or a consumer packaged goods product, if, if, if it's not authentic, the bullshit detectors out there are yeah. too high right now. People just know. Can't work what, authentically. So individual celebrities obviously gra can gather, but what do you see other sort of sectors that are ripe for kind of DTC type disruption, like sports leagues? I've been hearing a lot of chatter that regional sports networks, cable channels that are devoted to showing regional games of local teams, that those are you know that, that those are very much likely to go to go into a DTC for this for the reason to, that, yeah. that the, the the hardcore fans that want to pay that four dollars a month he, here's their opportunity. I think very much so. Look, anything that you can if you talk we're talking about entertainment here and yeah you know, we all, all sorts of packaged goods are direct to consumer now. There's thousands of new direct to consumer brands I will say that are out there. But with respect to what to our ecosystem, if it can be on a TV screen, it can be delivered over the top. There's nothing, there is no, and, and it can have a direct-to-consumer business model. There's nothing that prevents it. Everything's digital, of course, and has been for quite some time. And it's just a matter of which protocol you use to get it from the, you know, the origination point to the viewing point. Is it IP, is it internet protocol? Is it some, you know, the technology that, you know, QAM that, that, um, that, that uh, satellite and, and, and uh, cable companies use? Doesn't matter. What does matter is the business model. And I think that people are getting used to paying for what they want and not paying for what they don't want. More and more and more. And I think that is driving the unbundling of, um, of, the, cable net, of the cable system. It is driving people to buy more precisely. Regional sports networks have been a ripoff for a long time because they're very high priced and they're, then they're, they get packaged with their local cable companies. Right. And you have to buy a big local cable package and then separately on top of that buy a local sports. That's why your bill is 120 it's crazy. bucks. It's just not fair. It's not fair to those. To this, they're cross subsidizing a lot of people that aren't really sports fans, and that can't go on forever, especially at those prices. And if you think about the impact on marketing for direct to consumer, we we coined a phrase at MediaLink a couple of years ago, and and what we looked at was the traditional brand marketing thinking, and what we would always call performance marketing, or what you might have known originally as direct marketing, but performance marketing. And the artificial distinction between brand marketing and performance marketing was that performance marketing, go back to data, required more data, and there was a, a, a return loop because you could see what was happening. A specific call to action. And it was a call to action. Specific, right. And I, I really coined it coming out of work with American Express, where the chief marketing officer at American Express, Elizabeth Rutledge, challenged us 
to bring together her brand marketers, don't leave home without it, and her performance marketers, which is to make sure not only should you have the card in your pocket, but you should be using it. Because if you don't use it, they don't make any money. And so that idea came together and the light bulb went off for me and I said, so what you're really talking about is brand formance marketing. You want to have the same data infused into your traditional brand marketing that you do in your performance marketing. That's where I came up with the word, but where I really saw it play out was with Disney Plus and others, the other streamers, we were tasked with helping the marketing mentality at Disney Plus, and this is something Kevin and I worked yeah. on together, because traditionally the Walt Disney Company would market to put asses in seats on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday when they opened movies. And all of a sudden they had to be thinking in subscriber acquisition mode mm -hmm. with Disney Plus and you want to avoid churn and all the things you needed to do. And it took an entirely different marketing muscle and we had to not only retrain the internal team, but we had to find the right agency <coughs> partners Which we that, did. Could, Which was great. that could understand that. And I still, I mean, I still, I think it's pretty clear that like, I don't think any other company, only Disney with that goodwill and built in, you know, Warner Brothers as established as it is, people don't have that feeling for that brand that they do, that, that the, we were tracking that the awareness of Disney Plus was shockingly, it spread so fast that the, the hardcore consumer was, was aware that Disney Plus was coming. One thing we did. In an, in an incredible way. We set out a target and we did this together of 95% coverage of people on a monthly basis getting at least three exposures to Disney Plus advertising. If the top 95th percentile is getting three, that means the average is getting something like 50. That's just the way the math works. <laughs> yeah. We carpet bombed th this country with um, <laughs> Disney Plus advertising and it worked really, really well. And we got 10 million subs in the first day. Now we have built in brand equity, as you said, because it was Disney, that helps for sure. I'm not- Verizon helped deliver that. you a- Verizon, yeah. you know, Hans Vestberg and I did a really good deal uh, with Verizon, which by the way, worked out really, really well, better than people think. It was an for excellent deal. Verizon. For both, well, for, for both yeah. of us. Yeah. And a lot of those people that were getting Disney Plus for free for a year actually did convert over to be Disney Plus subscribers. So that was a big, big win, you're right. But then we took that learning that we, cre we created what I called to my troops, a consumer frenzy. There was a frenzy around Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. And we took that same exact um, philo philosophy and did the same thing in Europe before I left, Europe and India. And we took that same consumer frenzy and our team executed it really well during a pandemic. But it's all about extreme reach and frequency of our advertising message, yeah, you, which is beyond which Disney would normally do. You got to remember, it was good. Disney Plus launched November of 19, 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, three months before a pandemic or plus or minus, you know, three or four months. And, and the story has been obviously extraordinary, but it's you think great. of the timing of it. And, and I think back, it's kind of special to be on this stage because I was supposed to be on this stage <laughs> in 2020 on the, you know, I think literally two years ago today, uh, and here we are, which by the way, I just want to give a shout out to the South by Southwest teams because there is that special moment of being back together and being in person and IRL has, has attraction. It has been so nice and Austin couldn't be a more welcoming, just yeah, fun place right. to be. It's really, it's been nice. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you mentioning the South by Southwest people. They have worked hard and put on a very good event in, in tough circumstances. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to open it up to questions in our last few minutes here, but I wanted to ask Michael, um, part of Media Link's business is not as, not as well known as the, as, the, as the marketing and the consultancy is that you do some headhunting, that you do, do executive search, high-level executive search for media firms. What, I, know, I know you can't talk dish specifics, but can you talk about some of the, like, what, what, are, the, <clears throat> what are the jobs of the future? What are, what are the skills that people are looking for and what kind of placements are people looking for? That yeah, um, obviously I can't be specific, but I can be uh, generic. The great resignation is real. The great resignation has really created a circumstance where talent is uh, impossible to find right now across industries. But what we're really understanding is, and I'll take this from a TV show, there was a period in the marketing, advertising, media business that um, madmen were the people you were looking for. And today it's math men, <laughs> but math people. 
Today, you're looking for people who can actually understand the data. And data the, analysis and, and, is, and the, and the, the analysis, the job not of the just, future. It's not just about the creative, it's about understanding the type of creative. And look, our industries, respectively, uh, pivot on five words right now. And I, it, it, it's funny that I just kind of landed on this and realized all the words started with the letter T. And those words are trust, transparency, technology, transformation, and finally, to your question, talent. And coincidentally, they all start with the letter T. And in every aspect of our industries, where we come together, again, at that intersection of marketing, media, advertising, entertainment, and technology, if you find me a conversation that doesn't pivot on one of those five words, I, I would be surprised because that's really, to your question, talent is at the core, and it's really hard to find right now. The, the talent representation business is undergoing so much change well, the as, talent, as expected. You right know, now. bear in mind now that Media Links at UTA, I have to use talent with a small T and talent with a large <laughs> T. UTA is in the business of representing talent. We're in the business of identifying talent through our headhunting, head you know, practice. It's a little different, so we do have to use a capital T mm -hmm. and a small T mm -hmm. occasionally. True. Um, I'm hogging the questions again. Okay, how about, this is a good one, the lines between brand funded content and advertising continue to blur. What potential does Candle Media see in this space? I would, I would venture, I guess, a whole lot. I would, I would agree. <laughs> that is a, it's a question that answers itself almost, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And that's right. And by the way, lines are blurring all over the place between content and advertising, between performance advertising and brand advertising. I would almost say there is no difference your brand performance thing or every, all advertisers want, performance and one subset of performance is brand, another subset might be product placement, another subset might be true performance, digital digital, you know, call to action advertising. So I think um, we're, we're very focused on that. We think that having, having an audience and having a connected audience where you can actually speak and have a two-way conversation with your audience opens up these types of opportunities for monetization that just weren't there 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, this is a good one. I'm, I'm going to ask a oh. <laughs> I'm going to ask a variation on the the question that just that just uh, went by my screen here from Isabel. Thank you, Isabel. Um, do you think that we're obviously at a time in media and entertainment? There's a lot of consolidation. To your point of the need for a strong independent uh, idea factory more than ever, but do you think that 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 consolidation that is there a danger of the industry literally getting into you know three or four gigantic conglomerates that control everything? Let, let, let me give that a shot first. <laughs> um, I think a lot will be determined by what the Justice Department does with Amazon and MGM right now. That's going to have a lot to do with where this plays out. If the Justice Department stops that deal, which I don't think they will. I think that deal will go through. I think it's a lot of noise, but the deal should go through. There's no basis for it not to go through. I'll put on my lawyer's hat. Right. Uh, I don't wear it very often, but <laughs> I have it. Um, I think that deal goes through. And if it does, I think that bodes, I don't know if you'd say this is bodes well, maybe it doesn't, but it bodes well for others in the tech space to be making acquisition in the pure content space. Do I think you end up with three big players? No. Do I think you end up with consolidation? Yes. Well said. Yeah. Let me ask you, uh, Kevin, in our in our waning moments. Can um, we make a note of that? Because we actually agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I think we agree on just about everything. But you, know. you you've made it clear that you're looking for you know very creator driven companies. But is there you know is there a world where you would look at a more traditional you know there's some companies out there with a few cable networks, a studio, is there any, I mean, would you play in those waters at all? I don't think so. I don't think, I definitely don't want to play in the cable network waters. I just don't think that's a viable model for much As longer. we discussed, as we discussed. earlier. Um, and we're not, we don't, I don't like distribution brands as much as I like content brands. Brands that actually mean the, something about the content. We think Hello Sunshine is a great content brand. Moonbug's becoming a great content brand. We want to get behind and, you know, we have a, have a significant piece of Westbrook, which is Will, Will Smith's company. Mm -hmm. That's a content brand. Will and Jada have actually, one of the most distinctive shows to come out of Facebook is Jada's Red Table, yeah. which is to all, to all your point about authenticity. <laughs> she puts authenticity more on the than table. That, I will say. Yeah. I mean, it's a great show. Mm -hmm. So look, we're, uh, I think the answer to that would probably be no. We, we are focused on a couple things. Creator-driven companies where the creator is front and center a brand that arises from that, because we want to transcend the individual creator and get a brand that can 
live beyond that, that creator, obviously, but also that really speaks to a defined audience. Something else that we learned at Disney, know your audience and speak to that audience in as a full way and as a, sort of a diverse way as you possibly can. So we have, you know, Hello Sunshine, it's, it's, it's content um, created and delivered by women for a women audience. It's, of course, it's an inclusive audience. It, it appeals to a lot of different people, but it's really by women for women. Moonbug is kids. Um, I think we'll, you'll, you'll continue to see us look at the very, very most premium content brands we can get or develop that speaks to certain audiences. And then we're gonna fill out that audience map and then we'll, then we'll think we'll be in good shape. Is, uh, is Blackstone in for more? Do you have any of the two billion left? I would imagine you probably well, it was never went just two billion. It. I don't have this two billion thing. I don't remember where it all came from. Um, they're, they're, when, when Kevin yeah. and Tom started, started their company and started going out there, I, I honestly, I, I don't know, Variety was the guilty of it, but the number two billion that you guys had a two billion dollar bankroll. Well, that's, we've already deployed now four billion. Now we've set the record straight here. Well, there, there's been four billion dollars of, of <laughs> assets that we pulled together. So <laughs> I guess we've already. Math. But, you know, I don't want to, you know, there's all sorts of different, you know, Blackstone can put from the fund, their own limited partners in the fund can do sidecar investments. We've had that. We have some debt. People, when we buy companies, one of the things we insist on is they take a lot of equity in the new company as part of their the consideration for the purchase because we want everyone to have skin in the game for the entire company. The best way to do that, equity. That cross collateralizes everything in the company. Everyone has And, everyone and commitments bets on for it. them to stay for a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah. And then when you go public or get bought, probably I think we're, our path is likely an IPO. Then that equity becomes, you know, has some real, real um, monetizable value to it. But it's, everyone rose in the same direction. That's why equity is so important. Do you have? Thank you. I, I would have felt bad if I hadn't asked you about the I, uh, the future IPO. Do you have any kind of a timeline? Do you think that that for that happening? And, and do you think is there are there alternatives to going to an IPO route? Yeah, look, we have, we've built a company now that has a, the scale and the financial um, contours to actually go public whenever we want to go public at this point. I would say that Moonbug's alternative to being bought by us it, itself could have been a public company. And so it's a very, very, the financials there are very robust. So it's a matter of the markets being ready and, we, and us being ready as an organization to really want to be public. It has, you, did, you need some infrastructure, you need public company accounting systems and you know, Starbucks compliance and all that stuff, and we have to get get into that mode. And I would imagine but, also a couple of good hits. And would a couple of good hits yeah. would not hurt. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think I don't want to no no specific time frame, but it won't be many years from now. It'll be sooner than that, I think. My advice is take a breather, having bought, gone from being public for the last four years to being private again as of December. It's kind of nice to be private for a while. We have investors. Oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have to have some liquidity event of some sort. Be, it's, that's one way. We can get being purchased is another possible outcome. It's not what we're angling towards. You don't want to build a company to, be, to package it to be sold. If you want to build it, we want to build a company that can stand and live and thrive in its own right. So you need the fire in your belly you to build. Yeah, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Let me press you again on in terms of Candle Media. Will you, you, you were born in a pandemic. Will you at some, will you have physical office space at some point? Will you have any kind of we have office space. common infrastructure? Yeah, we will. Um, we have, you know, at, at the Candle Media corporate, we have, I don't know, six employees right now. <laughs> we have a little office on Sunset Boulevard, it's nice, which sits geogra geographically in between the Moonbug offices in, in Hollywood and the Westwood offices of Hello Sunshine. So. We commute between the two. But look, we have big offices in London for Moonbug. Um, there's about there's several hundred people there. We have, you know, Hello Sunshine has 100 plus people. They're mostly in Westwood, but in other parts too. Um, so we have, we have physical offices and we at corporate, if you will, um, we're pulling everything together. We, I think we have an interesting philosophy, Tom Staggs and I. One is that if you buy a company that, can, that has a capability that can be used across, outside of its company into all the other brands that we have, we're gonna use that. So here's an example. Um, Moonbug has this guy, Simon Phillips. He's the head of licensing and merchandising. He is probably the best executive in the world. He was at Disney. He was at Marvel when we bought Marvel. He was at Disney and ran EMEA for Disney when, we, when he was there. When I first visited Moonbug, I saw Simon Phillips. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I didn't know he was there. So he is the licensing and merchandising expert without parallel. And so to the extent that we have licensing and merchandising needs in Hello Sunshine, and we also bought the studio that, um, that, that produces Fauda, that um, Netflix mm -hmm. show. That Far just, Away Road. Far Away Road yeah. Pictures. That was a smaller purchase, but a great one. Those guys are awesome. And they, you know, to the extent that they, they're less likely to have kind of 
licensable characters. <laughs> it's it's right. pretty gritty stuff right. that they do. But uh, you know, but Will Smith. And, but the quality yeah, was so, was so quality clear is, in that show. I, I agree. It's, yeah. it's incredible. So, so, so for instance, we'll, we'll be we'll be uh, managing all licensed merchandising out of Moonbug. Um, we have a great distribution team at Hello Sunshine, so maybe that'll be the center of excellence for distribution for everyone. Mm. But we're, so it doesn't have to sit at corporate for it to be a shared resource. I guess is my point. So corporate will never be massive, but we all but we are going to tightly integrate all the operations uh, across businesses. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Kevin, tell, I know it's a little bit like picking children, but tell us one thing bubbling in, within the Candle Media companies that you're excited about coming up for this year. There are several projects. I, I, I can't pick one because that's not right. There are several big high-profile high projects coming up at Hello Sunshine. One theatrically released movie that's going to be, it's gonna, there's a number of things that I, I really am excited about. I'm extremely excited about the home edit, buying that company and seeing if we can grow that e-commerce business beyond, beyond which they could have done on their own, which is the thesis of buying them. I think we can. And then um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, one big breakout hit at Moonbug. We bought a company called Little Angel. It's a, a, a Montreal-based character. I think that we could do the same Coco Melon thing to Little Angel. I'd love to see that happen. And then maybe something in the gaming space. If we can get a big gaming purchase done, that'd be cool. <laughs> gaming was on my long list Gaming is, is something we're pretty focused Michael, on. Michael, I'm going to really put you on the spot. You have 120 seconds to tell us, tell us in, from your crystal ball gazing, what is something that we're not thinking about right now, but we will be talking about by this time next year? Some trend in media or advertising? Um, something we're not talking about now. Or not talking much about. Well, we are, but I think gaming is really the thing I would say where there is opportunity and you're seeing it, whether it was Strauss with Take Two and, and um, you know, Zynga, or obviously, you know, the granddaddy of, of all of this with Microsoft and Activision. There's a reason that's happening. And I think gaming uh, is a place where we're going to see a lot of attention. I'm starting to see it now really from the advertiser saying, OK, we've got to play differently here. And so I think that's what will be front and center. Uh, that is still, it's very much in the conversation now, but I think it's going to move to the head of the class in terms of advertising opportunity. It's just, it's too ripe. It's the metaverse, it's the first metaverse instance. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I guess that's, that's actually even a better answer, Kevin. You know, I took this seriously, and I'll go back to that first panel 20 some odd years ago. I realized then that having run the largest media agency in the world, I knew about linear television. What I didn't know about was dot-com 1.0, and I made it my business to go out and learn. We've done that again now, and a mutual friend of Kevin's and mine, Rita Farrow, who used to work for mm. Kevin, actually made a suggestion to me uh, in December that she had just booked a very big sale from crypto.com for ABC, Disney, and she said, I don't know enough about this I need to know more. She enrolled at a course at Wharton, and I did the same thing. So much oh, is wow. changing, I, and, and part of that is our live stream is ending. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. Thank you for all of your insights, your candor. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Austin, South by Southwest. This has been a blast. <laughs>